Uh, just a little bit more about me. Uh, until recently, I ran a multi-million dollar electron microscope laboratory at a state university in California, California State University, Northridge. And uh, until I published the work that you're about to hear, and then I was summarily dismissed. And, uh, and I think uh, you'll see why uh, when we get to the, the end of the presentation. I, I really want to thank the AG uh, for, for allowing me to speak, particularly uh, Steve Badger, Mike Tennyson, uh, David Bundrick. Um, uh, I, I don't see a lot of the people in the room that were in this room yesterday afternoon, which is a little disappointing to me. But uh, uh, so you're going to be my uh, missionaries and take this information out to them. I'm very happy to see that it's being videotaped uh, because I think everybody needs to see this information and not ignore it. Um, I think our speaker last night, our plenary speaker yesterday afternoon actually made that point. Keep an open mind. Keep an open mind and don't be, don't be closed-minded. Uh, I don't. I don't have any handouts. Uh, the proceedings, I'm, I'm assuming everybody gets a copy of the proceedings. Is that right? Well, they have to buy it. Uh, that's why I put my email address in blue. And uh, write that down while you can. I answer all emails. If you would like a reprint of the paper that was published in Acta Histochemica, which I'm going to talk about a little bit today, I'm happy to send you that. So stay in touch with me. I'd love to uh, uh, help answer questions. Some of this gets a little technical. And I, I try to work hard like, Dave, uh, like Douglas. Wasn't Douglas fabulous? Wow. Th that was so exciting to see a, a laboratorian performing science, publishing in peer-reviewed journals, and, and then making the application to faith. I think, and it's, it's, uh, I noted as I looked through the breakout sessions, it appears that I'm the only laboratorian who's presenting in the breakout sessions, peer-reviewed science has been published. And that was a little disappointing to me. I think uh, as a suggestion, maybe uh, we could do more of that in the breakout sessions in the future. But, uh, but nonetheless, I'm excited, excited to be here. Um, so the work that you're hearing today is peer-reviewed. It's, uh, it's been published in Acta Histochemica, which is an inter international journal. And, uh, of course, it cost me my job. But uh, I'm not, I, I will quote the work of others, but mostly to draw a contrast to the work that I've done and am doing in the laboratory. And that's, that's an important function of science. Uh, I, th I think, I wish we could see more laboratorians in the breakout sessions actually discussing the work that they've done and published. I think that's very important. Um, essentially, this presentation is, uh, is a, 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 a conglomeration of two presentations that were done at the Southern California Academy of Sciences. The, 95th session in 2013 and the 96th session in 2014. And again, it comes from the paper in Acta Histochemica. So what I'd like to do is a little review of these controversial findings of soft tissues. Many of you may not know that this has been in the technical literature for over 40 years. Uh, I find that most people don't realize that. Uh, Roman Paulicki started in the early 60s. This, this was an important paper of his in 66, where he identified uh, soft cells and collagen, et cetera, in dinosaur bones. So this has been in the open scientific literature for a long time. Now, why aren't you hearing about it? I think the reason is obvious. This flies in the face of old earth. It flies in the face of millions of years. And, and uh, it, it is unexplainable. I think you'll hopefully come to that conclusion at the end. This is unexplainable in terms of the science that we know uh, for how tissues behave over time. As a microscopist, I had to learn how to deal with tissues. And I was taught to process tissues at 4C, 4 degrees centigrade, on ice, as close to sacrifice, that's our term for killing an animal, as close to sacrifice as possible. Why? Because of autolysis, deterioration. Cells, you heard about some of the programming in the cells this morning with our plenary speaker, cells are also, they also have programmed death. They have machines, enzymes, proteins, like Douglas was talking about, that are programmed to deconstruct the cell as it's dying. 
And so as a microscopist, when I want to examine tissues at high magnification, I'm trained to use uh, very dangerous chemicals to preserve them, to cross-link all the proteins and keep them in, in their conformation on ice to prevent autolysis, the natural breaking down of cells. Now, you're, now we call this ultrastructure. We have structure, microstructure. We call it ultrastructure in microscopy. And so you're going to see, come on in, you're going to see examples of ultrastructure today that defy our understanding of science. How can they be there? But this has been in the literature for a long time. Paliki did a lot of uh, foundational work here. He has an extensive publication record. In 2000, uh, I was sent a, a T-Rex femur uh, from Texas that had been in a museum drawer for 100 years. And... Uh, thinking there's not going to be anything in this. I cracked it open and did scanning electron microscopy of it and identified collagen fibers throughout it. They were mummified, but they were still there. And so I, I think, well, I know, after some of this work has become more prevalent, Mary Schweitzer, we're going to talk about her work, because it's very, very important work. Many uh, paleontologists uh, who don't normally cut open bones <laughs> or dissolve bones in acid, or take bones apart, they, their holy grail is a whole bone, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's their grail. And so they do everything they can to reconstruct that bone and glue it all together and hold it all together. So the thought of taking it apart to see what's inside is anathema to a paleontologist. But many of them have gone back into their drawers over these last 10 years or so, mm -hmm. and they've done some of this work. And they found soft tissues. Uh, in these bones that have been in their drawers for many years, and they're not reporting it. I know of one lab, lab in England that supplies uh, uh, fin sections of bones from all over the planet to labs all over the planet, and they, they have a whole reference lab, a whole reference room full of examples of soft tissue, and they refuse to publish it. Okay, so is that science? You know, people, people often refer to me as a non-scientist because I'm part of an organization. By the way, I bring you greetings from the CRS. This is, we're celebrating our 51st year. We're starting our 51st year, which is very exciting to us. But uh, I've been called all kinds of names. Uh, in fact, I'm on a website called American Loon, if you want to look that up. <laughs> you know, and it's, it, goes, it goes with the territory. It's, th this is not about me. This is about the work. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the Bible. It's about winning people to Christ. That's what this is about. It's not about personalities. Anyway, Mary Schweitzer, University of, uh, sorry, North Carolina State University, she had a histology background, and when she was in her PhD program, under Jack Horner, who's the curator of the Museum of the Rockies in, is it Billings? I always get that. Glendive. Uh, it's not Glendive. He's, it's either Billings or? Bozeman. Bozeman, thank you, yeah. Bozeman. Bozeman, Montana, Jack Horner, uh, co-author with Mary on many of her papers. We'll say some interesting things about him. Uh, but, but she really started publishing some very significant work in, in 2005. That was uh, the T-Rex paper. And what did she find? They, they found a, a femur, and, and you have to understand most of the soft tissue work has been done with what they call long bones, femurs. And there's a reason for that. We'll discuss that. But they found a very large T-Rex femur in, in, uh, in the Hell Creek for Formation in Montana, near Glendive. And we've dug on that same ranch. And what they have to do in paleontology, you have to, you have to prep the bone by painting it with a polymer, liquid polymer that hardens. And then you jacket it, and then you roll it, and, and then you jacket it again, and then you lift it out. Well, it was so heavy, the helicopter that they had brought in to lift it out couldn't lift it. So horror of horrors they had to saw it in half and as they sawed it uh, pieces came apart Mary bagged some of those up UPS them to her lab because you know they're just bone fragments after all and she had her her tech put them in a weak acid called EDTA you might have heard of EDTA it has a lot of uses but it's used to dissolve bone mineral now when you think about bones think about the concrete slab that we're standing on, maybe on a, on a ground floor. You have a concrete slab, a lot of dense concrete in there, but you have conduits, don't you? You have pipes that are running through there, and the pipes are doing various functions. And so in order to get to the pipes, which in this case is vessels, we have to take away the concrete. And so 
How do you do that with the bone? You put it in EDTA and it dissolves away all the bone mineral and so you're left with the pipes. Make sense? So that's what Mary's tech did. And she, she brought the results to Mary and showed her these vessels. Soft, pliable, stretchy. Maybe you saw the 60 Minutes interview. If you haven't, just go to YouTube and type in Mary Schweitzer and this wonderful 60 Minutes video shows up. And Leslie Stahl is, is uh, interviewing Mary and Mary shows a video of her stretching some tissues. And something interesting happened in the, in, the, in the interview. Leslie Stahl saw her stretching the tissue and she went, no. Now I need you all to practice that. <laughs> because I'm gonna show you a stretchy video today. So on three, ready? One, two, three, <gasps> no. Good. So you're ready for when that video comes. Her tech showed her the work and she said, uh, no, that's wrong, go back and do it again. And the tech kept doing it over and over and over, and they kept getting the same results, soft tissue. So they had to come face to face with the fact that they were seeing vessels complete with uh, the hollow uh, nature of them, the lumen of the vessel showing the hollowness. And uh, of course, she couldn't call them vessels because you can't do that in science. You, you, after all, it's 65 million years old, so you call it a vessel-like structure. <laughs> and so when you read her paper, it's vessel-like structure. When you, when you see the uh, obvious red blood cells, uh, and she showed this to a group of veterinarians at a veterinary conference, and every one of them looked at the microscope and said, these are red blood cells. In the paper, she called them red blood cell-like microstructures, <laughs> okay? Because that's how science is done. And so, so all of this was published, a, a whole series of beautiful uh, figures, in many plates that she has. And this, of course, came out of the Hell Creek Formation. Now, this got my attention. I had, I had studied Pauliki before for my 2001 paper, but Mary's work really got my attention because it was comprehensive. She showed all kinds of structure, labile, you know, stretchy structure that can't be. Everything that, that we know about the age of the Earth <laughs> And paleontology screams, this can't be there. I often ask people, how many of you have buried a pet in your backyard? Okay, imagine digging up your pet and finding this kind of stuff in your long buried pet. Wow. You, intuitively, you know that it's not gonna be like that. Why? Because the soil is a harsh environment, right? And up in Montana, where there's all these horrible conditions, you wouldn't expect to find this. Now, Again, most of these discoveries for, are from long bones. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about long bones in a second. But I want to focus on one particular cell that Mary focused on called osteocytes. Now, osteocytes are a diagnostic feature of bone. What do I mean by that? Any microscopist who's looked at any bone will see osteocytes. It's just like a, a hematologist who works with blood knows what red blood cells like, knows what white cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, platelets, they know what these look like. Why? That's their craft. And so any histologist who's worked with bones, any, any pathologist recognizes osteocytes. They're a, they're a diagnostic cell. And I, I could spend two hours just talking about osteocytes. These things are amazing. They, they, your bone, your skeleton, I've read is replaced every 12 years, something like that. Now why? Because there's three basic bone cells in your bones. There are osteoblasts that are busy bu building bone, making bone, making bone, making bone. And they actually cement themselves in. They make a little space called a lacuna that they sit in, they lay in. And then they build these little tunnels called canaliculi in the bone. As they're building the bone, they build these little tunnels. They radiate in all directions. Why? Because they're gonna put little philopodia through those little friendly feet that go out and touch each other. So your bone is like your brain. It's got all these interconnected cells that are measuring the compression as you lift and walk and stretch. And they're, they're correcting it. They're looking for microfractures and correcting it. So osteoblasts are busy building cell. Osteoclasts, those are the ones that are deconstructing cell. They're actually demineralizing your bone and, uh, and providing the raw materials for the osteoblast to rebuild, right? Why do we get osteoporosis? 
because those two cell populations go out of kilter. When they're in equilibrium, they complement each other. But as we age, osteoblasts uh, die off a little bit relative to osteoclasts. So these guys are busy taking it all apart and who's not available to rebuild it? So we get voids in the bone. So we take amazing drugs, <laughs> amazing drugs that rebuild the population of osteoblasts only. Pretty cool. Then there's osteocytes. These are the guys that are cemented in and they're touching each other, they're talking to each other. So they're amazing cells. I wish I had more time. And she compared what she found in the T-Rex uh, tissues to ostrich uh, and other avians. Why? Because dinosaurs, you know, are avians. They say, when you eat Thanksgiving dinner, you're eating dinosaur. <laughs> okay, we'll give it to them. But, but, uh, but what did she find? Mostly she found floating free in these solutions these cells. Now that's completely different from what we found, as you'll see. I want you to pay particular attention to her scanning electron micrograph. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, because mine are different, and I'll let you decide if they're better. Anyway, she had a wonderful plate of all these different osteocytes. And I have to go quickly, I'm so sorry. See the little arrow there? Little arrow down here. Little arrow, I think, on that one. Yeah. Little arrow here, little blue arrow. What is she pointing at? She's pointing at organelles. Now we have organs, cells have organelles, like nuclei, mitochondria, Golgi body, all these different rough ER, uh, smooth ER. All these organelles are in the cell in this fantastic robotic city that we've heard about. And she's pointed out these cells not only have the philopodia, they not only have all their exterior structure, but their interior structure appears to be intact as well. How can this be? Right? Autolysis, remember? And we'll talk about other factors. But again, uh, mostly at Glendive, mostly in long bones, and mostly free-floating cells, not sheets of tissue. Let's talk about the instantaneous criticisms that arose as a result of her publication. Uh, first of all, the contamination charge. And, and in order to explain to you how ridiculous the contamination charge is, we're talking about osteocytes, diagnostic cells for bone. Now, not only do they have the structure that I've showed you, but they're also parallelly and superimposedly, I don't know if that's a word, but they have confirmation with each other. They're in a pattern in the bone. They're not askew. Uh, they're all lined up like soldiers on parade. Okay? And, and so the, the charge is that this bone was laying in the ground, this femur, and a bird died maybe on the surface above the bone. Maybe it was flying. And as it crash landed into the dirt, it broke a bone in its wing you're following me already, aren't you? <laughs> and an osteocyte, which is diagnostic for bone, crawled out. This is the, this is the charge, folks. Crawled out, crawled across the matrix. They don't call it mud. You know, there's such job security in science because we have all these words. Crawled across the matrix, found the, 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 the femur, somehow crawled inside and aligned itself perfectly in 3D space with the other osteocytes. Well, that's patently absurd on its surface, so we don't even have to consider that one. But the other strong one was the biofilm explanation. They said that this is nothing more than the leftover remnants of bacteria which feasted on the original tissue, deconstructed it, and left this comfy environment called a biofilm that they live in. It's a, it's a polysaccharide, it's like a sugar, a little sugar house, sugar shack, okay? And, and they live in this and then when they die, the biofilm remains, right? But what are they begging us to, to accept just out of hand? That the biofilm lasted 68 million years, which is on its face absurd. There's no mechanism to preserve sugars in the soil they go away quickly. You heard Douglas talk about that. These things are gobbled up instantly. Number one. Number two, replication of philopodia. 
So here you have a cast off, a sugar shack made by the bacteria that's actually replicating Philopodia. It's taking the exact shape and conformation of a Philopodia of the cell. And not only that, organelles. As the bacteria is munching on the cell, it's reaching in, feeling, feeling the organelles and spitting out a biofilm that looks like what it just ate. Okay? People would win the Nobel Prize for this, folks. If they could prove that this happened, this is Nobel Prize material. Okay? It's, it's fantasy. And I say, what of the original intranuclear molecules? We're going to talk about this. Mary found original intranuclear, that means inside the nucleus, molecules. Okay? Actual dinosaur molecules. So those are the criticisms. And you're going to see how, I mean, the first one obviously doesn't make sense. But the second one, how Mary put together an elegant series of experiments that nailed the coffin on the biofilm uh, charge. And here's how she did it. And this gets complex fast, so I'm, I'm just going to go over this quickly, and I apologize for that. Email me if you, if you really want to understand this in detail. This is what I was doing at Cal State Northridge before they threw me out the door. She was using a confocal microscope, and she was using antibody bloodhounds. I call them bloodhounds. Why? Because they're, they're going to go look for specific molecules. And they're trained to just go after. You heard Doug talk about shape. Uh, uh, protein. protein shape is like lock and key. Everything, they're like little motors. And so, so she used antibodies, uh, which we're going to go look for actin, which is a cytoskeletal protein. We have a skeleton. Cells have a skeleton. Okay? Actin is one of the proteins. Uh, tubulin is another cytoskeletal protein. And she didn't just look for those. She looked for anti-avian, anti-reptilian proteins. Very specific. And histones. What are histones? You saw that in this talk yesterday, in the talk that was here yesterday. The DNA wrapping molecule, uh, uh, proteins. Histones are proteins upon which DNA is wrapped and super wrapped and triple wrapped and quadruple wrapped to get those little chromosomes. These are inside the nucleus. So now you're begging a, an avian histone to crawl across the matrix, crawl into the bone, find the cell, find the nucleus, take up shock. Okay? Do you see why her work is so foundational here? And so this is what she found inside the osteocytes, all inside these osteocytes. And she's got an elegant series of pictures that show that. And what are the critics now? Here's the three responses from the critics. Utter silence. Or maybe they throw you out the door and maintain the silence and rewrite your employee file in the HR department. <laughs> oh, no, they didn't. Oh, yes, they did. We can talk about that. Or they backpedal. This is what uh, Jack Horner's doing right now. He was on an interview. You can hear this on, online. Bob Enyart from uh, Denver interviewed him, and he said, well, we don't know what these things are. Now, this is after he co-authored with Mary all these papers that say exactly what these things are. So they're backpedaling, or they cover it up, which I already mentioned to you. I think they're burying this work because this is explosive. This is explosive. I actually had a professor, before I was thrown out, storm into my lab and tell me, and again, I'll send you the reprint of the paper, and you can see if there's any religion in it. He said to me, we're not going to tolerate your religion in this department. This is a science department. And I asked, what's unscientific about soft tissue and dinosaur bone? And then he walked out. Well, we went to Hell Creek, and we found a very large triceratops horn, over 40 inches long. Uh, same, same area that uh, Horner and Schweitzer dug in. Um, and so... We were excited, but at the same time, we were sort of uh, dejected. Why? Because the conditions were not conducive for preservation at all. Now, remember, most of the soft tissues come from where? Long bones. Now, long bones are heavily impregnated with bone mineral. They, they are compacted concrete. <clears throat> so it's not a stretch to imagine that soft tissue would be in these things. But this was a highly vascular bone. It was moist. It was riddled with plant roots. It was riddled with fungi. Uh, in fact, I did a diagnostic test showing the septi. These are the little cell walls in a fungal strand. It's diagnostic for fungal uh, hyphae. 
we also did, and I mentioned this, we did a blast DNA analysis and, uh, and we recovered something like 35 different types of organism uh, DNA. And so this was under assault attack by the environment. It actually, when we rolled it over, it fractured into, into quite a few pieces and roots going through it. So we were fairly dejected. And remember, most of this is from long bones, which are well sequestered, versus the vascularity of the horn. This horn is highly vascular. If you look at the end, and I've got another better picture of this, this is full of little straws called vessels, completely exposed to the environment, sucking all the matrix up into this thing like a straw. And, I, and that, I think, um, also shows uh, why some of the preservation uh, is the way we find it. This made the cover of Ameri American Laboratory. So people recognize, people who are not afraid, I guess, of these findings, recognize the value of it. Now I told you I was gonna show you the stretchy video. So this is where you go, <gasps> no. And so here's a sheet of tissue that was recovered near the horn core. It's been fixed in a fixative and it's in phosphate buffered saline and it looks like a piece of taffy. How can this be? How can this be this stretchy when it's 68 million years old? See? So anyway, that's the stretchy vi video. I have a couple more to show you, so I'm going to try to work quickly here. Um, here you can see a piece of bone where the soft layer was literally peeled away from the bone. It, it, it had adherence to the bone, but it peeled away. And so I have a peeling video, which I can show you quickly. Come on up here. There we go. Can everybody see that? And now I'm going to peel, this is a piece of the horn, and I'm going to peel this away from the horn. And so this is that stretchy tissue that you saw being stretched later. Here it is being peeled away from the bone. Now I thin sectioned this. I thin sectioned it because I wanted to prove it wasn't a biofilm. And so I did thin sectioning and the lights are a little bright in here, but here's an osteocyte. You can see all the little philopodia. Here's another one. These sections are, this, these are a little better. Here's a piece. And of course the American laboratory photo <coughs> was not dissimilar to this. It had all these cells and, and they're in a z-axis. So let me show you the z-axis video. And you can see how this stuff has several layers of cells. Mm. So I'm just going to grab this and just move this and you can see all the different layers and how these things are interconnect interconnected. So what did we find that was different from what Schweitzer found? We found entire sheets of stretchy soft bone. Now this is you know, bone lays down collagen, right? It makes a matrix of soft stuff and then it impregnates it with all the bone mineral and then it becomes hard bone. So we're seeing pre-hardened bone in the horn that was full of bacteria and microorganisms and fungal bodies and algae and plants. Sorry, I have to go so fast through this. We decalcified the bone. Now remember, you're putting in an acid that dissolves the concrete right? All the concrete is dissolved. What are we seeing now? This is the plumbing. But notice on the plumbing, on the inside of the plumbing, covered over by the concrete, there's what? All this soft stuff. So we thin sectioned that. Here's a big piece of it here, full of osteocytes. So we're seeing several examples of soft tissues in this horn that are full of osteocytes. Now I put it on the scanning electron microscope and, and you can see, particularly here, here's a vessel and look at how permineralized that is. That's all, why? why? Because the matrix flowed up through there, right? It flowed up in there with silica and all the minerals and, and that it carried along with it, with the water, and it, it permineralized it. So the whole, all the vessels, all those straws were hardened, turned into stone. But what, what about the stuff on the inside? And here you see, you see these little lines here? Those are sheets of soft fiber, bro. they're laid down one on top of the other with the osteocytes in between. They make little sandwiches. So we magnify this and look at that. Here's the leading edge of a sheet. It comes down here, then it comes back up here. 
that's one sheet and it's laying on another sheet and it's laying on another sheet and it's populated with osteocytes. And I want, to see, I want you to see some new pictures that were just taken on a beautiful brand new Carl Zeiss electron microscope that does not require me to coat this with metal. I'm not gonna talk about that, but most specimens for SEM have to be coated with metal. Here is no metal and the level of preservation is more staggering than we originally thought. I need one of these. Yeah. I need $140,000, please, somebody. <laughs> but look at that, it's staggeringly. This is, now, compare that to Mary's picture of osteocytes. And you tell me if they're better. And this is in a non-sequestered bone, highly vascular. They all have the conformation. They're all lined up like soldiers on parade. Look at the philopodia uh, extending through sheets. There's a sheet. Here's the philopodia extending through. Here's another sheet, philopodia extending through. Look at that. Some of these philopodia approach uh, 20 microns in length. That's huge. I I'm sorry. Yeah. 20 microns in length, the whole cell is 20 microns long. And so some of the philopodia, this ultra structure goes away quickly. Why is it there? How can it be there? Now, recently I've been working on isolating individual bone cells. So, so getting the cells off the bone and into solution and washing them, why? Because we have to do the protein search. And so this was a huge step to learn how to do this. And you can see organelles that appear to be present in some of these. Uh, we have to do this in order to find the intact proteins, such as actin tubulin and histone. So this work is in progress. I have a little cell video that shows, uh, here's an osteocyte on a slide in solution. I want you to watch this little philopodia right here. Uh, I'm at 1120, can I keep going? Yeah. Okay, so let's turn on this video and watch that little philopodia. Uh, watch it move, right, right there. See it move? That's not permineralized. That's, that's soft, see that? So these are soft cells. We have done some elemental analysis on this and they do return a signature with a little bit more oxygen and a little bit more carbon than the surrounding bone. The problem is they're too thin. And when you, when you do elemental analysis with an electron microscope, the beam takes a volume out, out of everything it goes through. And so I'm gonna take the soft stuff and fold it up on itself multiple times and then do an analysis and I should just get the organic material. Here's another video, just so you can see the 3D Confirmation. This this thing is a. It's not flattened. It's a 3D structure. So these are. But I had a, a PhD say to me, "Why don't you culture this stuff?" And I thought, it "Does look alive, doesn't it? They look alive. Look at the collagen fibers. That's all collagen." Now we carbon dated this to 33,000 plus or minus three, but we only use the exterior part of the horn, and most of the collagen is found in the horn core. So that's, that should bring the date way down because of all the collagen. Just a note point. Yes. Yeah, they told me at the cafeteria that don't expect to get lunch until 12.15. Oh. Because the kids are going to be in there and they'll take up all the space. Oh, good. Uh, so there won't be any, it would be set standing in line, just wait. Okay, good. So I can slow down a little bit. <laughs> so, so give us more good. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Play on. Okay. All right, okay. <laughs> They, uh, another feature, I talked about the philopodia being long, which is a, f a feature of ultrastructure, which should go away very quickly, but primary and secondary branching, which means they branch and then branch again. So, so these are all important features of these tissues that show them to be, can I say the M word, miraculously preserved? I've gotten in trouble for saying that. I've had several <laughs> creationists yell at me. You can't use the M word. That's not scientific. But yeah, remarkable, certainly. But, but as, a, as a, a tissue person, one who works with tissue all the time, I've, I, I can't explain this by any known mechanism that we know of in science, and in, in certainly in microscopy protocol. It's staggering. Um, 
This was also off the Zeiss microscope. This is called a backscattered electron image, which is a little different way of looking at it. Here's the one from mine. This was a coated specimen, coated with metal. You have to coat it with metal because you're actually hitting it with an electron beam, and so you have to close the circuit. Kind of like when you were young and you licked your finger and stuck it in a socket, and you became part of the circuit. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that. <laughs> I did it three times. And I have a heart, little heart murmur today because of it. I think it's probably because of that. Maybe many other stupid things I did. But here you can see the lacuna. See that shadow in there? That's where this guy cements itself in. And look at all the philopodia. Look at all these fabulous philopodia branching out and talking to other cells. Now, we put a scale bar up here. And it's a little hard to see. There's two green lines there. And the space between them is 250 nanometers. And some of these philopodia are thinner than that. This becomes important because Mary published a new paper this year. Mm -hmm. Mary painted herself in a corner as, as an evolutionist. She, she still believes in evolution. She still holds to deep time. And so she, she did her work so carefully that I think she woke up and said, holy cow, what did I just do? <laughs> and so she had to come up with an experiment to explain a mechanism for this preservation. And so what she did, anybody read her paper or heard about it? Uh, yeah, what she did is she took, she took uh, ostrich femurs and decalcified them, took out the soft tissue. Then she started spinning down blood, blood from chickens, blood from ostriches. She spun it and respun it. And sp why, why do you spin it? Get all the cells out. She took all the cells out. By the way, in her paper, she did not mention that she obviously used an anticoagulant. When you go give blood, those little tubes have a little thing in the bottom of them. A lot of that's anticoagulant. Why? Because blood clots, right? It clots right away. Why? It has clotting factor built into it. So she obviously had to use an anticoagulant, which she didn't publish in the paper. And so she soaked this ostrich tissue in there for two years in a bucket on a laboratory bench in an air-conditioned laboratory. And said, that's just like the Hell Creek formation, <laughs> which is not. And then she did microscopy of the cells and she showed preservation. And if you look at one of her figures, she's seeing, you're seeing all this little iron, uh, iron oxide filaments they're little crystals, all adorning one section of the tissue which is preserved. You look at the other side of the same micrograph and there's all this preserved tissue with no iron filaments. It's kind of like the La Brea tar pits. Who's been to the La Brea tar pits, anybody? Okay, now what do they tell you when you walk in there? What do they tell 30 million school children a year? They <laughs> fell in, yeah, yeah, they, they <laughs> fell, right? They, a, a horse wandered out into a clearing to drink water. Yeah, right. Now, I learned in kindergarten that water floats on oil when you combine them. Yeah. No. no, it's the reverse. Right. Oil floats on water. So a horse with a 50 times better sense, nasal sense than you and I have, can't tell that it's gonna drink oil before it gets to water? Problem number one. Problem number two, they got stuck in the tar and so they twisted because the saber-toothed tigers were coming and they had to get out. <laughs> There's no green bone fractures in any of the ho uh, bones found. None of the long bones have, and you know how easy it is for a horse to fracture a leg. No green, born, green, green bone fractures. No gnawing marks on the bones. You don't know this, do you? No. You don't know this. Do you know that you can dig 100 yards away from these pits and find the same exact fossil assemblage with no tar? You did not know that. Why? They cover it up. It's a flood deposit. And they've turned it in to a teaching tool for evolution. Okay? It's the same thing here. If you're going to publish micrographs that show highly preserved tissue with iron fillings, make sure your micro micrograph is cropped so you don't include the part of highly preserved tissue with no filaments in it. Because people like me look at that and go, well, that's obvious. Okay? So I think, I think it was sadly a desperate attempt. Uh, you know, I've often asked the question, 
Why does Mary Schweitzer get to keep her job and I don't? Because I did basically the same work that she did. Not entirely. We're, we're trying to get there with this horn. But it's because I don't genuflect to evolution. Like Douglas was saying, you read these scientific papers, fabulous science, you get down to the last paragraph, and evolution did it all. Yeah. They're genuflecting to the priesthood. And I won't do that because it's, it's not science. It's philosophy. It's religion. And so when Ernie said, we're not going to have your religion in this department, three of his fingers were pointing back at him. Okay, continuing on, we fractured some of the bone. Just, just flat out fractured it just to see what would happen and put it under the SEM. And here you have soft vessels now protruding from the bone. These are not permineralized. So it's selective permineralization. Why aren't all the vessels permineralized? Uh, I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah. Right? Now look at this. Again, Mary called these red blood cell-like microstructures. <laughs> Those look like, and they're about seven microns in diameter, which is the typical uh, width of a red blood cell. But look at how packed. You can hardly see the vessel. This is called a Haversian system, very diagnostic of compact bone. Everybody recognizes this and packed with what look like red blood cells. So this kind of preservation is problematic, but I ask for who? Yeah. It's not for me because I'm an unabashed, unapologetic, young earth creationist. Um, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not. This is the fourth job I've lost from my position on Genesis, okay, in academia. And uh, so I'm not going back to academia. I don't think it's, at my age, it's probably not worth it. But it's not problematic for me. It's only problematic for those who hold to deep time. This, this is a frontal assault against deep time. It's really hard to get around it. What mechanism can account for this? I don't think iron oxides can. What is the mechanism that can preserve these tissues in a highly vascular bone, in, 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 a, in an environment that's full of autolysis, the automatic breaking down of cells, hydrolysis, water breaking down these proteins and molecules, freeze-thaw cycle. This is three feet or less from the surface of the Badlands in Montana. It gets cold there, wow. right? How is that possible? Infiltration of plants, fungal bodies, insects, microbes. Uh, like I said, 35 different times, types of DNA we found in our blast analysis. Uh, I hope you emailed him to ask him for a report because I haven't gotten mine yet. He just, he just emailed me this and I'm waiting for a written report. Plus carbon dated to 33,000 years. This bone is well impregnated with matrix, the dirt. My question is why is anything still there? By everything I know, it can't be. DNA, they've now shown, has a half-life of about 521 years. That's published in the open scientific literature now. A lot of these proteins, a thousand year half-life. So, I have a scientific prediction. And the reason I'm doing this prediction, the reason I want this on videotape, so I'll stand, where do you want me to stand? Because I'm good. Here's my prediction. The reason I'm doing this prediction is because I'm setting myself up as a straw man. You heard a lot of straw men set up yesterday in this room and knocked down. Well, here's one you can knock down. My prediction is this. The fossil record is full of soft tissue. This is the norm rather than the exception. That's my prediction. And, and so I invite whomever, to prove me wrong. Go out and dig up the fossils. Do the decalcification. Do the microscopy. In fact, I will teach you myself if you don't know how to do it. Because I want you to prove me wrong. If I'm wrong, I want to know it. But that's my prediction. This is the norm in the fossil record, not the exception. They often say creationists don't make predictions. There's one you can write down, you can email it to all your friends, get them a copy. How do we get copies of this? Get a copy of the, the, the DVD and send it out. Now here's one possible explanation. 
Why? Because those who cling to an old earth have no explanation for this. That's why they become silent. That's why they throw people like me away. That's why they ignore it. My, my major professor used to say to me, my boy, he was from New Orleans, Dr. Richard Lumsden. My boy, don't be afraid of where your science takes you, right? Even if you're going to lose jobs because of it, don't be afraid of it because you're pursuing science. And that, that's what's important. I'm not important. In fact, I marvel. Why did God pick me to find this stuff? I marvel at that. I'm a nobody. I'm really a nobody. And so, wow. Uh, and I'm energized. Kind of like carbon-14 in diamonds. Have you heard this one? The evolutionists knew that there was no carbon-14 in diamonds. They knew it wasn't there. Why didn't they go looking for it? They knew it wasn't there. Why? Because they're old. Can't possibly have it. Who found carbon-14 in diamonds? The creationists did. Why? Because we didn't know that it wasn't there. I could, I, I could spend hours talking about rock-hard evidences for young Earth. Radio halos in granites. Radio halos in diamond. I photographed radio halos in diamond. Uh, the zircons full of helium in the rocks. Uh, so many evidences exist for young Earth that are published, that have, uh, stand unrefuted, and they're ignoring them. Why? Because it doesn't fit with their explanation. Well, I say, why not this explanation? Isn't this a beautiful explanation? It's so simple. A four-year-old can understand these little pillows, night, light and dark, right? The firmament, waters above, waters below, right? And so on. The six days of creation. And God took the seventh pillow and put them all together and laid his head on them when he was done, <laughs> right? That's so simple. Why, why can't we preach and teach this? Jesus did. Paul did, right? That's where the spiritual world. Amen. And we need to pray for people, don't we? And we need to be loving, don't we? We got to be loving. It's hard. And I'm going to share some things now that are really hard for me to talk about. Yesterday it was said in this room, if you're a young earther, I mean, if you're, if you're a young earth creationist, you're a flat earther. The statement was made that young earth creationism is the tailings of flat earth movement. And we need to put YEC to bed. Did you hear that? Yeah. I heard that. It was so hard to not take personal offense at that. But you know what? I let it go. I let it go. Because that's what Jesus wants me to do. Jesus wants me to love those people. Be firm. Preach the word. But do it in love. Right? and compassion. That's what he would do. So I would like them to tell me what is flat earth about the laboratory science I've shown today. Please point it out to me because I don't see it. These passages used to bother me. When I was a young Christian and I was trained in evolution at the University of Florida, Exodus 20, 11 really bothered me. Why? For in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. I had to pack that one away and not look at it for my whole college career, right? It bothered me, why? Because I knew better, because of my training. Matthew 19, this one used to bother me. Jesus said, at the beginning of creation, the creator made them male and female. And he was teaching against divorce, which is so prevalent in the church today, right? He was going back to Genesis and quoting Genesis as a solution to our modern day problems. Okay, little quiz, and I'm gonna write this down. I'll try to go quickly. Who can tell me the first sin recorded in the Bible? First sin recorded in the Bible. Come on, you guys, you're scholars, you know this. Well, what's the obvious one that we're all thinking about? Adam and Eve eating the apple. That's not, did you know that's not the first sin in the Bible? The first sin in the Bible is this. Doubt of the Word of God is the first sin in the Bible. I don't, want to, I don't want to commit that sin. And it's the same old sin today, isn't it? It's the same old sin. Did God really say in six days, did God really say at the beginning the Creator made the male and female? 
right? Genesis 3, 1. Who can describe for me the first miracle performed by Jesus in his ministry? This one used to bother me. Yeah. Now, here's his first miracle as a minister at a wedding. And he made something new out of something completely different by speaking. And it had the appearance of age, didn't it? It was the best wine. That has the appearance of growing on a really good vine, being trampled by the cleanest of feet, <laughs> being stored in the best of wooden flasks and aged properly. Now that's exactly what he did in the Old Testament in Genesis. He spoke and created new things out of things that were completely different and they had the appearance of age. Do you see? He does naturally what comes naturally to him. We're, uh, we're at 20 till. Do I, need, do I need to end? Let me end with this. We, heard, we know what Jesus taught. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. What's the takeaway? The takeaway is I've given the old age proponents an opportunity to make me out to be a fool. Haven't I? I've set myself up as a straw man. And so if it's time to put young earth creationists, people without credentials, did you hear that yesterday? Young earth creationists who don't have credentials, if it's time to put them to bed, put me to bed. Thank you, God bless you. I'll stay around as long as it takes for questions. But if you're hungry and you gotta go, by all means, go eat. Other, Amen. And two, we're not doing good science. That's why this was so hard for me. Amen. About good science. Amen. I don't, I don't believe in young earth creationists, but I want to hear what you have to say. And I want to hear what the evidence is that you have. Yes. And I want to know how and you got at that evidence. Yes, yes. And how you interpret it. And yeah. Those are all important. They're parts. all important. And science needs to be completely transparent, doesn't it? We may all be missing something that we could put together in a more harmonious way and be more effective in reaching, because our whole purpose is to reach others with the gospel. Amen. I mean, That's our purpose. Here? That's what right. We're trying to do. We yeah. want to reach others with the gospel. That's right. So to reach others with the gospel, we have to love each other. Exactly right. It sounds like you could have done this talk. Yes, sir. Uh, how did you say the whole the whole uh, I would be comfortable with the horn at under 10,000 years. My question, yes. Ready for <laughs> uh, I don't think so because DNA does break down so quickly. I think it'd be awesome personally, uh, but, but I don't think so. I think it's, and you can't use frog DNA like they did in the movie to fill in the holes. It does, you saw that in the presentation earlier. Yes. creationist why uh, why it, it all has to be it's like you're either if you believe in creation you're supposed to be you believe in a 6,000 10,000 year earth span or does it have to be 65 million years can it be a million years can it be it, you see what I'm saying I do I, I'm a creationist. yes I'll you know when, when, the, when the arguments made I always begin it by saying let's just settle this when we start whenever it happened however it happened God did it God made it he began it and he's the one that sustains it yes but um, it's almost like they're not mutually exclusive are they not really they they cause problems in and of their inherent selves it's never an issue of fellowship or salvation <laughs> right okay sure. never uh, and I, I want people to understand that I'm definitely saying that. It's, uh, I will never say that someone is not a Christian because they believe in old age. I'm called to be a witness, not a judge. Right? Testify. Number two, I think the inherent danger in it is that we begin to question the Word of God. And I think this, this has probably pulled more people away from adherence to scripture, this issue of the age of the earth, 
than any other issue. Uh, and that to me is what's pernicious because I think it is coming from Satan. It's his old trick from the very beginning. We see that clearly in scripture. He introduced doubt into the daughter of God who was walking with him in the cool of the day. She had an awesome relationship with God and he introduced doubt and it caused the separation. Christianity is all about relationship. Right. It's all about relationship do, together theory, and with him. Theory, stuff like that really they did in my life. I can only speak for myself. They totally did in my life. And I, I look back on my life. God has done so many amazing things in my life since I decided to completely trust his word. Before then, I struggled so much with so many things. Now, my life is so different. It's so rich and full. And, and I'm so happy full of joy, gratified, because I don't know who holds the, what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, so I don't worry. My, my first wife got cancer from worrying, and I saw that take her body down. And, and it was then that I decided I'm not, gonna st st I'm not gonna start doubting God, I'm gonna trust Him. So personally, it's enriched my life, it's made my walk with God so much more dynamic, because I trust him completely. Every word that he put in there to me is there for a reason. And I feel sorry. I really feel sorry for people who are not experiencing what I'm experiencing. And it's not because of me, okay? It's not me, it's all him. He's pouring himself into me, why? Because I'm an open vessel for him. Oh yeah, Deb brings up an important point. The, the real other real problem is if you have millions of years before Adam and Eve, you have millions of deaths. Hmm. Millions of what? Deaths. Deaths. Depending right. On what was here, though, right? Yeah, but whatever was here, I mean, I mean, the way we're taught in, in Genesis is there was no death before Adam and Eve. Death came by way of sin. Now I know people interpret that differently and all that, and that's okay. But but he calls the garden very good, and if the garden is built on a graveyard of bones. I have a problem with that. Sure. Yeah. Yes. For those who are interested in a rebuttal to that, the complete or, uh, the, uh, the breakout session that will be in this room in the afternoon will actually address that point specifically. Good. Good. Thank you. So, but those are just my personal observations. Um, well, I, I think for Christianity to survive, we at least in whatever whatever interpretation you end up with, we have to agree that Scripture is inherent. Scripture is final authority. Yes. We can, dis we can discuss on how you interpret what's written there. Yes. But we can't discuss whether or not it's right. And don't be dogmatic about it. Right. I mean, I think the reason I'm dogmatic is because others are dogmatic. And you don't know how hard it was for me to bite my tongue yesterday. Yes. I was a little confused. You were saying that the bone was dated, carbon dated to 33,000 33, 33, 33, plus or minus 3,000. And that was the, the exterior. Tissue, Correct. Soft tissue not able to be dated at all? Well, there wasn't a lot of soft tissue in the sample that we sent because it was an outer portion of the horn and, and there's a horn core. Most of the soft sheets came from around the horn core and that's not what we sent in. Now, we just recently, I think, sent that in, I'm trying to remember, and that should bring those days, those ages down because collagen is loaded in there, as you saw by the pictures, and it should bring the date way, way down. It should all be the same date, ultimately. Well, the problem with dating methods is when you send in a rock for dating, you have to tell them the ages you're looking for because you get a range of dates. And so you say, I'm looking for 30,000, and they go, okay, 75, 50, 45, 12. Yeah, we got 30,000. That's how it's done. There shouldn't be carbon at all. At all. Right. It, sh it should be carbon dead long before that. So that in itself is why those reports, you can find <laughs> reports in the carbon literature itself all the time where they just simply dismiss it as must be contamination because it possibly couldn't possibly be there. Exactly. They call it contamination. Isn't carbon dating pretty much a, well, I mean, a, it's been proven time and time again to have an unreliable. Yes. I mean, well, it's, it's a method. 
Yeah, it's, it's one of others, but it, it's a best guess. And so it's not an exact method, but, but Kevin's right. The, the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years. And so in 50,000 years, you're carbon-14 dead. There's nothing. So that's why finding it in diamonds was so powerful because it's the hardest substance known to man. You can't punch carbon-14 into a diamond. It's too hard. Great question. There were a lot of other Hell Creek formation and other from around the world. Hugh Miller, I think, is the guy who's done a lot of this. I think if you just Google him, he's got tons of dinosaur bones that were dated much younger than this. So that's why we're going to send back a piece of the horn cord because we'll, we'll conform more to the dates that they're finding. But Are great there question. Are large mammals in that same formation? Oh, yeah. There were, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cement mixer. Yeah. Uh, marine turtles. All kinds of stuff, yeah, found together, so, yeah. Yes, and then. Well, I just want to say, uh, I'm an old earth creationist myself, but I love the Lord, I enjoy the Lord, mm -hmm. I trust in Him. Good. The, the point, so we have to separate those things. We can't be saying, well, if, if you don't Thank believe you. the Word of God the way I do, you're not really loving God the way I am. You can't say that. No. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. You're you're right. You're exactly right. I grew up where the Baptists were fighting the Lutherans, right? I had a friend who told me, I can't believe that you haven't baptized your kids because now you have ungodly people running around in your house. Becomes issues of fellowship. Yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Find a way to get through our disagreements without Amen. tricking each other. Amen. When it comes to science, not religion, or Christianity, when it comes to science, young earth is going to have, Thank you guys. Going to have the, long, the, be, the best legs. So, yeah, yeah. We, have to be, we have to be accurate with our science, and that's and why... The earth is going to have big space. Yeah. This is, where, this is where it's heading. This is where the momentum is going. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but, but we have to remain true to our science. And, and there's, there are so many assumptions with old age uh, acceptance that are invalidated by the Thank science. You so Thank you. No problem. By the science that's published today. That's why I got so excited listening to Douglas, because here's a laboratorian working with proteins, trying to deconstruct them and showing how the odds are so huge against right. getting a usable protein by point mutations. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah, so, uh, so we can't be closed-minded, but like you said, we have to be open-minded to this, and let's not close one group out. And I, I'm not sure, I'm not really familiar with the AG, but I get the feeling that, and this is just me, well, I don't think so. I think they're off the fence. And I think they're really strongly in old age and almost pejorative to young earth creationism. And that's too bad. Ah, okay. who's an AG. Uh, I did not know that. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of AG ministers uh, or others who are associated with our churches that we're struggling between what we're seeing in the fields and in the, the laboratory versus, you know, what the doctrine has been since 77, and that's hmm. why we changed it in 2010 hmm. to, as you say, end the, the dogmatic debate back and forth and say, you know what, as the real issue is Christ Amen. in us, yes. not this fight back and forth of, well, you're interpreting it wrong, well, you're interpreting it wrong. Right. That's, that's refreshing to hear you say that, and I thank you for the update. Now, you need to understand my angle, because this, to me, is a witnessing tool. Oh, when, I, when I'm sitting in front of a waitress, like I was yesterday, and, and she said, how are you? And I say, I'm great, because I went to a dinosaur dig. Instantly, you've got her attention. I've been in a grocery line 
where people would leave the other line and come to my line because I'm talking to the cashier about soft tissue and dinosaur bones. It's a, it's a way to preach the gospel to people who've been beaten down by billions of years. But we do that, and um, most of you probably don't know that we operate two creation museum ministries in this area. Wow. One in Stratford, the great metropolis of Stratford, if you have heard of it. Bless you. Humanists from Springfield. I did not know that. And we just recently opened one, just an ama amazing leading of God to a location right on the 65 highway. Wow. Two humanists north of Branson. We opened about 10 weeks ago, and we've already had uh, about 800 visitors. That's awesome. And part of it is we actually quote Mary Schweitzer's actual statement. Good, where good. She said, it was exactly like looking at a piece of modern bone, but she said, of course, I couldn't believe it because I know the bone is 65 years old, you know? <laughs> and we used that exactly, we used that as a witnessing tool. And why did we, we have a, we had a, an elderly lady come up to us at a, when we had a display table in a large church in this area, and with a rather skeptical look on her face, she said, and what exactly about a creation museum is a ministry? Hmm. So I had to explain to her that everything in our museum supports the history of the Bible using biology, archaeology, geology, paleontology, etc. And that we actually get to present the gospel as part of the ministry of a creation museum. That's awesome. And um, so um, I have a, only one more. Oh, I would love one of those. Yeah, yeah. I'd love one. one. Later, if you can get one from me. But we just opened um, 10 weeks ago in Branson. A wonderful location. That's awesome. But Praise God. One more thing. Um, the, the bottom line to me is young people. Uh, the 5,000 people that visited our little museum in Stratford over the last three and a half years, the vast majority of them have been young people. We get homeschool groups, uh, Christian school groups, uh, youth groups, uh, church, Sunday school groups, you name it. Perfect. And that excites me because these yes. young people, when they come through our museum, they, yes, we are the young earth position because we believe that's the more scriptural and science supports it, but uh, they hear over and over again, the Bible is true, you yeah. can trust it. Yes. God's word, real history supports Amen. it, real science supports it, mm -hmm. um, and so forth. Thank God we have two PhD biologists on our team. One of them, uh, you connected with Evangel, you probably you may know Dr. Dale Schusner. I'm not familiar, but he teaches right here at Evangel. Mm -hmm. And um, so we thank God for people like that. Yeah, that's part of our team. That's fabulous. So, um, Let me get to this question right here real quick. I'll, I'll hang around, though. I'll hang around. No, I, no, it's fine. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I was in the session yesterday yes. that you were in. And so um, when you see both sessions like this that are so opposite in, in their nature and in their evidence and their findings, you know, he's got the the telescope that's looking out and it's saying that it's 13 point whatever billion years old. And then we see that these tissues can't be any more than 30,000 years old. How do we marry this, this, the, you see what I'm saying? Because both I sides do. have so much evidence pushing both of them is, um, what do you do with that? You know what I'm saying? What, yes. what, what do they say to this stuff? Obviously, you, you know, they said they're silent, but for the young earth, looking at the old earth, what do they say about the, these, uh, you know, telescopes looking at all the microwaves and saying it just didn't, it just didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Right. Well, this is why I love biology, because biology can be repeated over and over and over and over again and get the same result. Not so with astronomy. In fact, can any of you prove to me that there's not uh, a bunch of uh, uh, moving van people 30,000 light years away moving mirrors right. back and forth mm -hmm. showing you things that aren't really there. I mean we can't get our fingers around it like you can with biology, like you can with osteocytes. Now the COBE satellite has been highly promoted as evidence of the Big Bang, but most people don't realize that, that what they were trying to measure was below the resolution of the instrument. So they were measuring noise. Well, they, but they've got a, that's not true. They've got a that's not true? No. That's what I've been told. That is, uh, much more refined than they maybe, maybe a newer one. one. Yeah. The, the Planck uh, satellite. Okay, is, yes, uh, the Planck is new. It has the resolution to find the small te temporal change, temperature okay. changes. Okay. But I was referring to Kobe, so I'm not up on Planck, so thank you for correcting me on Planck. Planck. But. Uh, but my point is, we're looking at things that, that we're making assumptions of. The closer science is more accurate, and it's more theoretical. 
I believe so. Yeah. I believe. So you got to go uh, the closer science. Well, I believe astrophysics and astronomy are are highly theoretical, and and so I would say educate yourself like I just did by learning about Planck. Mm -hmm. Okay, always stay in school and be willing to learn the things that you don't know that you're ignorant about. And, which I am. I'm highly ignorant about most things astronomical, so that's why I don't talk about it. Uh, but, uh, but, but study the science carefully and look at the hidden assumptions, okay? I, I don't think I've made any glaring assumptions here. If I have, I would like to know what they are. But I think this is pure, straight vanilla science. Objective. I'm trying to be. Sure. Uh, I don't think that's the case with a lot of astrophysics and stuff like that so and there's folks like Russ Humphreys who I think is well credentialed and can answer some of these things and has he's actually made predictions about the magnetic fields on planets uh, in the solar system and he's been proven right which were in contrast to the leading thinking of the day when it came to magnetic fields on other planets so it's gratifying to see someone like Russ mm -hmm. who knows so much more about this than I ever will making predictions and being proven right by some of these NASA missions. Uh, so how do you marry the two? I think, I think we have to have a lot of love for each other. We have to talk with each other. We gotta other. talk to each other. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we can't take it personally. Sure, right. Can I just but, uh, one, one quick uh, yeah. quote from Dr. Einbein. I guess, uh, I guess his name is pronounced Einbein instead of Einbein. If, uh. if it was me, it would be. <laughs> yes. Dr. Einbein is was the uh, head astronomer or head of the astronomy department in Phoenix, uh, Phoenix University in Arizona. Okay. He made this statement: "It's a bit of an embarrassment to realize that we do not understand ninety-five percent of the universe." There you go. Yeah, that's, right. that's, yeah. Well, that's being things, honest. For example, the Kobe satellite observation: if you took your thumb and just took the top part of it and put that up to the sky. And then you extended your arm 20 times further. That would be the swatch, swatch of the sky that they're measuring. Right, very small. So how do you measure yes. the whole sky? And that, that's why I think they shouldn't make such big pronouncements based on that data point. You know, let's collect tons of data. Yeah. They are scanning the whole sky.